Oh boy. Ready. Hey everybody, it's Mark Patterson. I'm back again with another great episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And before I get into today's amazing guest, I just want to remind everybody to go to my website. Uh, I am headed down to Ecuador to climb Code Epoxy for my 60th birthday. I will be going to the top and doing and dropping down and doing 60 push-ups on top of that 20,000 foot peak. This is going down in December. You can follow along on my website, www.markpattersonnfl.com. Also, uh, the documentary that the uh, NFL did on my Everest journey is out on YouTube. You can catch it now, searching for the summit, punch it in. It's a 30 minute masterpiece, in my opinion, not necessarily because it's uh, on my journey, but because of their amazing ability to storytell. And at the end of the day, it's about a guy who went through a tough time, got healed and turned around and helped his daughter, which leads me to another tab on that website, the philanthropy tab, Amelia's Everest. My daughter does have epilepsy and we continue to raise money uh, towards Amelia's Everest um, all the time. 100% of all those proceeds go to higher ground. And of course, if you want to hear more uh, amazing podcasts of people doing incredible things and inspiring people like me to go out and achieve, um, tap into that. There's over 200 uh, podcasts that are on there. And, and I look forward to doing today's. I'm actually over the moon excited about doing today's guest. He's a rock star. He's accomplished so much. He's from my hometown. We're just meeting for the first time today. And he is the one, the only Fred Couples. Fred, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. That was a great uh, opening your show. I'm, I'm, I'm like, you know, so many athletes and, and they don't do a hell of a lot like me, you know, people say, what do you do when you're off time? You own a restaurant, do you do this? But what you're doing is absolutely amazing. And I've done a little bit of homework uh, because I'm meeting you through a good friend, John Bracken. Yeah. And uh, I act, I'm, I'm amazed. So your next trip to Ecuador, uh, I will probably be following you. I don't know, how, <laughs> but what, what kind of a time frame is that once you take your first step? Yeah, no, it's not that hard and it's not that far, but, you know, it's really a probably two or three day. It would be very similar to climbing Mount Rainier. So Mount Rainier is 14,500. I've been up uh, there multiple times. I've had the great pleasure of climbing with a climbing legend named Ed Veesters. He lives here in, in Sun Valley. And, um, you know, it's it, it, it unique to a lot of the places you go, maybe not the Himalaya in Nepal, but, um, you know, when you land in Quito, uh, you're landing at 9,800 feet. So, um, I think where you currently are um, in Southern California, you might be at one foot and if you could yes, add, or less, yeah, yes. or less. And, and I live in Sun Valley, Idaho, it's 6,000 feet and we're going to go up another, you know, 3,800 feet. And, you know, interesting enough, and, it, it, and you can't just land here and go there. Uh, but like in Nepal, my base camp was 17,500 feet. Imagine that another 5,000 feet higher than, and than, than Mount um, Rainier. Um, I want to keep on that theme with the, the, the Mount Rainier being in the great state of Washington and, and you're a guy who, as it turns out, we're, we're, this is our first time that we're actually chatting, we, but we do have some common friends. Um, and for years and years and years and years, I've been the secret golf um, fan and I try to play golf, although I hack it up around the course like most people, but you're one of the few guys in the world who have been able to sustain that magic and make that into a gigantic career for you, you know, full-time traveling the world, uh, being involved in all these major tournaments, being one of the more popular names out there, being in multiple Ryder Cups. It really blows me away at the kind of career that you've had. Let's start back in, 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 in Seattle. Where did that golf bug come from? Because from a guy, by the way, I, I went to Roosevelt High School, and so I grew up in kind of the viewers Lorehurst neighborhood, right? And you were up on Beacon Hill, so not too far away. And, yeah. and, 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 and uh, Jefferson Golf Course, it, you know, it, it's a great public golf course, but, you know, it's kind of a gopher hole, you know, track, <laughs> right? I mean, it's not going to be the Masters, right? Augusta, yeah. by any means. And, and where did you start to kind of get that bug? Because, you, you know, your swing is so beautiful and it's smooth and everything else. But where did that all, where was that foundation formed? Well, that's a great question. So my brother went to Franklin. Mm. And I went to a little school. Uh, he's, he's almost 10 years older than I am. But the reason I'm bringing him up immediately is he has a big twist in how I got started playing golf. So 
I moved from where we used to live, which was right down off of Rainier Avenue yep. uh, by the Dairy Gold, which was where my father worked in the mornings and he went to another job. But so we moved up to Beacon Hill. I, I was like a kid out of place. Um, I couldn't handle it. I didn't want to go to school. I didn't know anyone. And so after a couple of years, I started to play golf with, with really a friend of my brother, Steve Dallas, who was on the baseball team at Seattle U. Mm-hmm. And so I was nine years old and I caddied for Steve. And by caddying for him, he gave me a set of plastic clubs. And then I just started going. The closest course was Jefferson. Yeah. It had a nine hole par three course, which as a nine and 10 and 11 year old, I, I would play all day long. And so uh, I got $5 a day, which was three fifty for golf as a junior player. And then I had a dollar 50 to spend on a burger and a Coke. And I played soccer in the winter time. Um, and then at the age of like 12 and 13, I just stopped playing golf or baseball, which my dad was, was my coach and it crushed him. But I just felt like golf was a game. I, you know, I, I could think about things. Uh, I wasn't a different kid. I loved, as I got older, I loved where we lived. Just the move really, it kind of just threw me for a loop because then my brother went to college. So he wasn't coming home from Franklin, you know, every day where I could at least bump into him. I do have a sister who's a little older, who's phenomenal, but that's really where golf started. And I will say this, and I say it a million times growing up on Jefferson was probably the greatest thing for me. As you know, Mark, the greens are tiny. Mm-hmm. So when I played on PGA tour courses, I actually, once I got going a few years, I was always in green. The strongest part of my game was my iron play. Mm -hmm. And I always was in greens and regulation because if you can hit the first green at Jefferson Park, you can hit the first green at Pebble or Spyglass or anywhere we play. Mm -hmm. And then as I got, you know, a little bit off the West Coast, I had to learn about Bermuda grass and how to play out of there. But um, Seattle was an unbelievable place to grow up and for me to play golf. Well, not only that, but, you know, when I was out on the uh, Bureau Ridge and Laura's playgrounds uh, playing football, you know, half the time or more, it was raining. I was in a T-shirt, and that's just what – I didn't know any better. I didn't go on my first recruiting trip until I was 18 years old, and I got a recruiting trip to Hawaii. I went to a number of different places, but that was it. And so that's all I knew. And just like you, I'm sure you played multiple times out there where, you know, you had these adverse conditions, you know, rain coming down, the wind blowing and everything oh. else. And, and I know there's a lot of trees out there at Jefferson, but – but you still have to deal with those conditions. It's not bright and sunny Southern California. No. And I hate rain. Now, when I actually, <laughs> when I you know, when I wake up and I know, you know, it's not going to be lightning or thunder and we're going to play. I, I actually, I don't panic, but I, I don't look forward to playing. Whereas when I was 14, 15, 16, honestly, we played, you know, the, the best weather in Seattle in the wintertime is when it's crystal clear and it's 34, 35 degrees. Yeah. If it gets to 40 or 42, it starts to overcast and rain. We, we played in everything. And again, I, I had a bunch of buddies that would play with, with me. So it was a no brainer playing in the rain. I never wore a glove. I used to, but you know, as I said, $3 and 50 cents to play around the golf, but way back then, it was like seven or eight dollars for a, a really good golf glove. And my parents said, no, Moss, I can't keep giving you money because you're ruining him in the rain. So I learned to play with no glove on. And that's pretty much the reason why. Yeah, uh, I, I don't play with the glove on. I'm not that great of a golfer. So maybe I should <laughs> switch it over and play with the glove. But, you know, you mentioned the word dairy gold and, and nobody else on the planet knows what we're talking about right now. But that was a old uh, milk delivery service, essentially were back in the days before you would go to the store and buy your milk, there was a delivery milkman that would come to your door like the mailman and drop off, you know, five quarts or something of milk. And that is just, so when you drop that down, that's like a blast from the serious past that I know you legit are from Seattle. Oh no, for sure. So my father who passed away years ago was an unbelievable athlete and and an incredible dad and uh, loved sports, which when I do my radio show, I'm a lover of all sports. I'm really saying that for my father because my dad, we would watch any sport. We would watch pool from, you know, snooker. We would watch soccer way back when. And so one, one of the things, you know, when he got up, he, he would walk to Dairy Gold. He would put the milk on the trucks that were delivered. 
And then he took a bus most of the time to the Woodland Park Zoo. He ran the zoo. And then there were some times to make a little more money. He stopped, you know, and for weeks and months at a time. And he worked at the Seattle Tennis Club right down there by the lake, cleaning up. But one thing that he always, he never had a job that was indoors once. And I never have either. So we kind of have that same thing going where he, as a kid, um, he worked at the Woodland Park Zoo and then he ran the zoo and he had a crew and I used to, as a 14 or 15 year old, I would go hang out with him a little bit um, and drive the Cushmans and screw around. And then they put him to pasture at West Seattle football stadium. So I could go play West Seattle once in a blue moon, then I would see him and then go tee off. But basically uh, we're alike in a lot of ways, but, but again, you know, the idea of, of uh, working hard was both my parents were incredible. And if I learned anything, it's, you know, working hard is, is what you have to do. And I just last night was in the car with Suzanne's son, who's 13. He's a very good basketball player. And I said, how good do you want to be? And he says, well, no, I, I, it's my favorite sport. I want to be really good at it. And he really is. And I said, do you, you're 13. Do you have a concept of what working hard is? And he says, well, you know, I, I, he works with the guy who played at Syracuse. There's four or five kids that they pay him 25 bucks. His name's Rudy. He's incredible. And I said, no, but I mean, you, you need to eat, drink and sleep basketball. I know you don't understand that because you got other things and I'm old, but most of my friends who have become athletes who I know, you know, again, he's a very good basketball player. I said, you, I, I just want you to listen. I'm going to tell you, most of them have the ball or club in their hand all the time. And he says, I, I get it. So if we dribble the ball around the block, cause we're screwing around, I, I like that. But uh, when I played golf, I played a lot of golf. I play so little golf now, like, like you were saying, but when I was 16 and 18, well, I left school to go to Houston. And by the way, I didn't go on any recruiting trips either. I, I just kind of picked a school and never in Houston. And uh, it was so hot and humid in August when I, when I arrived there, I, I thought, what have I done? But um, I think the game of golf in Seattle, I, this will be probably the third time I've said this, has put me where I'm at. I, I absolutely wake up every morning and I check out the stats and the scores. Now it's easy to do because they're, they're given to you at every outlet in the world. I used to love the Sonics. I love the Seahawks. I love now the Kraken and I'm a big Seattle guy. It's just so hard to live there and travel that I I really never went back, but I enjoy going up there that really the two or three times that I do, but I'm a golfer. So the golf part in Seattle really made me the the player that I am. Amazing courses up there. Um, you know, there's a guy that I want to understand how, uh, what kind of golfing that you did at O'Day if that helped to really nurture. <laughs> I know that uh, you're, I think it was your senior year, uh, you're playing in the Washington Open um, and you beat a guy who's at my course in Seattle, Sal Golf Club, Don uh, Beads, right? And uh, yeah. you, you nudged him out. So I'm, I, I, he's got to be at least 10, 15 years older than you. Um, Probably, so, yes. Probably. But so you go to a day and I assume you're on the golf team, you know, there and you were just talking about, I'm just trying to understand the recruiting process because golf, well, I mean, it was at a high level with Jack and, and Arnold and those guys from that standpoint, but it didn't get really like supercharged to me at least until the kind of whole tiger phenomena happened. And it just went from that to that, you know, just much higher, but but when you're picking golf, like did the University of Washington not come after you? I mean, here you win oh, yeah. Washington Open. It, like, how did you pick Houston? I, I, I will tell you. So the scenario beating Don Bees, I didn't even know what I did. I won at Glendale. I shot 65 my last round. I kind of obviously 65. I came from nowhere. And I still have the the little uh, the little check, $250 that I won as an amateur. And I don't even know what the pro would have won, 3,000 or, or whatever, it doesn't matter. But um, so that kind of put me on on the map, so to speak. I won a lot of junior tournaments. I, I as you said, John Bracken, Scott Williams, uh, uh, um, there's so many good players. My mind's blank because I haven't been really thinking about it. Bob Baldridge was unreal. There were some very, very good players at Oregon and UW. The reason I knew that is because they're mostly from 
Oregon or Washington, and most of the tournaments I played in were against them. And so our coach Williams at Houston would call every, every Sunday. And I realized that once I got to school, because we would go to his office on Sunday night, he was calling Willie Wood, who was the top amateur player at the time. And so we would sit there and I would say, hi, Willie, how are you? It's Fred Couples. You don't know me, but I'm in coach's office. So when he did that, my mom basically is the one who said, you're going to University of Houston. Um, they had a great team. They won the NCAA the year before at Yale. And then they had four guys graduate. So the worst thing, as you know, you're a receiver. You want to go to UW because you want to go and you're the second receiver and you, you don't play any. So yeah. I got a break by going to Houston. The very first week I qualified for a tournament, made the team, and I played all three years uh, with, with a team that was very good. I wouldn't say awesome, but we had a lot of good players. If I would have gone there and maybe been the seventh player, I really don't know what would have happened. So I got there. I played all the time. Blaine McAllister, who yeah. is Sun Valley, he's a five-time champ on the PGA Tour. He was a teammate. Um, and we, we, we've been talking more now because he's a Houston Astro nut. So uh, we've been talking baseball, but he was on the team and we had a great group of guys. Jim Nance was our sweet mate. What, 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 what are the chances of that? I mean, con considering and like, like you're, you're there to play golf, right. And do your thing. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, that your career could have gone in so many different directions, but what happened happened, right. In terms of your greatness, but with Jim Nance, you know, there's a thousand and one broadcasters out there trying to make their way and some never make it past the regional you know, maybe some, but, but I mean, he has become the gold standard, especially for the masters. Well, let me tell you. So when I got to school, the first three people I met were coach Williams, Blaine McAllister and Jim Nance, Amazing. Jim Nance's father, his company moved from New Jersey to Houston. So Jim was going to university of Houston. He went and met coach. So of all the guys that were around, uh, early in our, I mean, I, I, had to, I had to report there August 15th. So by September, we were already roommates and our coach would always say, Jim Nance is going to be president someday. I, I, I don't know why I was too young of a kid to realize this, but he wouldn't go around saying you're going to be on the tour. He would talk about some of his other guys, Bill Rogers and Fuzzy Zoller and uh, some great, great uh, Kermit Zarley that went to Houston. He would talk about them. But he never really looked at myself or Blaine and said, you guys are going to be great tour players. But he did say over and over that Jim Nance was going to be president someday. He saw something in him. And then once we started going, we got through the first year. We didn't really even know. He was working, I think you called Mark, like for the API and the UPI, yeah. getting clips of you catching a pass at the Astrodome yeah. against the Oilers and, and getting a clip from you. And he was selling those. And he was making twenty five to thirty five thousand a year as a sophomore in college. <laughs> and we were going, you know, he would take us to concerts and uh. he had the money. But he he got he got me to go to class. Uh, I absolutely love the guy. As, as you know, he's he's in the top of his own. And what he would do in our room is he would come home at night and he would have clips of of Nolan Ryan and, and Bum Phillips and all these Warren Moon and all these people. And then we would talk and he would say, you know, here comes Blaine McAllister up the 18th hole of Augusta. And he would do it for me. And then he would interview us when we were 18 years old. And then fast forward to 1992 when I won, he, he says it's the hardest day he's ever had doing a show. And I'll tell you, once I saw his face in Butler cabin, it was the hardest thing I've ever done and I ended up bawling like a baby after we went off the air because I never looked at him. I, I, I had my hand like this a lot when I was yeah. talking because I just I wanted to get through Butler cabin yeah. but he's an amazing guy and I've known him since we were 17 and 18 years old. Yeah what you're referring to right now is 1992 when you won the the, the Masters in the Green Jacket uh, at Augusta. Um, you know it's, it's 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 funny and interesting because you have your circle I have my circle and, you know, I could reel off a bunch of names. Jim Moore, as we, we mentioned before, we go way back to freshmen in college and there's a lot of dirt before they became, you know, big timers. And, you know, from Morton Anderson and Howie Long and Lester Hayes and all those guys I used to hang with, you know, with the Raiders. 
Um, there's there's a lot of dirt that will always be kept in. I mean, there's not bad dirt, but just you yeah. know, you, you go out and it's just yeah, it's just stuff as as we all mature over time, and you're in your earlier twenties, and this is before you understand about consequences. <laughs> Because yeah. you're you're nothing to the world, right? You're nothing to really anything outside of yourself and your teammates. But um, it, it's wonderful when you have those those memories and being able to be in that position um, and 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 Jim in that position, Jim Jim Nance, to be able to deliver that award to you. He's been doing that now for a long, long time. Um, I, I can't even imagine the emotion that that must have been going um, through. So, how many years were you at the University of Houston? I went three years. You went three years and then you go pro. And, you know, so I'm just going to go down to the bottom line and tell me if I'm wrong when I have this, my factual one. But, you know, when you talk about, you know, globally between the, 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 all these tournaments that you put them together, the masters and the senior tour and all this stuff, there's 84 tournaments that you've actually won. Yeah, that's a funny number. But if you, if you start counting the little, the member guests that I won or the club championship, they all add up. But, I did win a lot, you know, like that, when you win a skins game, they count that as a win, but really I probably have 40 well, I, in Europe champions tour, regular tour. Yeah. Uh, but you know, like when I would play in the skins game in the desert and I won, they would, you know, they would, they would count that as a 2001 champion, but yes, it's a lot of wins. It's funny to me, but you know, a lot of them, I, I just forget about, but I do have a lot of, spots i wish there were more tour wins um but that's nor here nor there but yeah by playing i mean as you said i'm 62 years old my goal is i had a couple great chances this year too um but i want to win i won't ride off into the sunset but i want to win one more champions tour event and i keep watching bernard langer who's a couple years older than me and he wins yeah. he's still winning two three times a year and he just won in a playoff just two, three days ago, and he's amazing, but I need to stay healthy and keep plugging along and work a little harder. And I, I honestly wouldn't do it if I didn't think I could win. That's what I say all the time. I don't want to play the champions tour just to, you know, finish 20th and 30th. So my goal is get one more win and then, and see where it is. And if it's a major, you know, then I can say goodbye. And I, my goal is to play with my buddies and and have fun, not so much travel around. The last two years has been probably for you too. It's, it's been really a struggle, um, you know, and, and, I, and it's not sour grapes. It's, it's, you go to the airport and because not many people on your plane, your plane's canceled. Yeah. You got all your luggage, you've already packed up, you're sitting there Sunday night and they say, no, we can't get you to Orange County or LA. So then you got to go find an airport hotel. For me, that's stuff that I'm not really, I'm a spoiled cat, yeah. but I'm, really used to that it just becomes oh my god you know now i i gotta sit and rot and watch this sunday night nfl football game on tv on a in a beautiful hotel room but i'm ready to get home i love being home yeah no that, that's very understandable well staying on the same theme then um i know that you've had some some back injuries over the year that have like shut you down like just as your career is taken off then all of a sudden you know this tweak and you know the 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 mechanics of swinging a golf club is all about your back right yeah. i mean your foundation hand eye these other things too but if you don't have a a, a, a strong core you're 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 not going to make it and so where are you in terms of the health of your back and and what you're able to do you know you can probably see i'm very twitchy I, it's hard for me to sit, but I'm in a great chair and I just, I just try and find pockets. I just had my back worked on oddly enough the last two days in the desert and I drove home. Um, I've been doing well. I slipped uh, right before the Ryder Cup on Sunday and Sue falls off the tee. It's a funky tee and I kind of wrenched my back and uh, that was three, four weeks ago now. So I've kind of let it heal, but um, you know, I feel blessed. I, I've never had a thumb injury or an ankle that was broken or a neck. I can play around my back. I can get it around. But but when I can't really swing, then it's then I just I get away from it and I let it heal. I've never had a surgery. Um, but but the idea of I'm 62, I've had a back injury since 1990. Mm. And that's when it really, really started. So that's if you look at it, I mean. 30, time. 31 or two years of 
you know, I've, I've had great help. I've had a couple great therapists that can get me to play. And you were talking about core. And, you know, when, when people look at me, I've gained a little weight in the pandemic. I'm not thin and I'm not heavy, but I'm, I'm in a spot where I need to lose a little weight. But I'm strong in about three places, which really help my, I can only speak for my game, but I'm very strong in my hands. Mm -hmm. And then I have a, a strong, really shoulder turn and I'm strong in the middle. I wouldn't say my core and my belly is, is like concrete, but I'm, 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 I'm very strong in the legs and that's how I swing. If you watch, I, I pick the club up, I make a huge turn and then I come down and my hands are an integral part of, of me making contact and hitting it hard. What, what does that mean though? Because when you're talking about strong hands, like the way that that's my biggest problem because you know, like when people see me grip, it looks like I'm ready to go kick some ass, right? I've got yeah. veins popping out and that's the last thing you want, right? Because you want those soft hands, but you're, you're describing it as strong hands. Great. Well, great. That's, that's a great way to come back at me. So Arnold Palmer, the way he grip, I have a very strong grip and unusual grip. Arnold Palmer, very soft grip. So I grip the club very, very light. Yeah. But when I make the transition from getting back to coming down, you know, the, the, the way I've been able to get the strength it's like baseball, you know, it's easier to explain to someone baseball when you're, when you're watching the picture, you're not death gripping it, but you're milking it. And then the timings there, golf's the same thing. You don't, you don't want to death grip it at the start. Cause then your takeaway, you're going to, you're, it's not going to be very good. I'm not trying to teach anyone. I'm just explaining for me that I'm, you can almost come up and pull the club right out of my hand. But when I transition it and a lot of it has to do with a strong, strong grip. Yep. But, but it's given me a way where I, Again, my hands have really never hurt. Um, and it's more of a power position through the ball for me. Yeah. So you see uh, anything can happen. Brooks Kepka two month and a half ago hit a root, almost couldn't play at, at the Ryder Cup, and he healed pretty fast. Anything can happen in golf. But a lot of times people will just hit a ball, you know, and they'll shake their thing and they're hitting a the driver off of a tee. It, it, it can happen. For me, I've not had any of those little nagging BS injuries. You know, I, I want to bring this up earlier uh, when you were talking about that the, the kid that you were mentoring and then what you've done in terms of, because you know the path, but, you know, and I heard this yesterday on another podcast and I really agreed with what, what this guy said that, but um, the, 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 that the path to greatness is a grind. Greatness is a grind is essentially what they said. Yeah. And so really understanding that and being able to be out there every single day and hitting the ball and going to the, to the range. And you've, I can't even imagine the amount of buckets you've, you've hit, you know, just going out there and working on your game and all that kind of stuff. But be, because you were saying that you pulled it back just a little bit, especially the pandemic made the whole year for everybody super wonky. And we're still experiencing that right now. But um, are you still in a place where you have that drive to go out daily or is it more weekly or how do you keep the consistency knowing that you want to have at least one more win on the players um, championship tour. That's a great, that's another great question. So I'm not going to go back too far, but when I was a kid, I had unbelievable friends who wanted to play golf. Um, so I went and played. I, and I also played, there's a guy, Jay Turner, who's a few years older than me, but his father, Hans Turner, when I was 15, he was probably 65 and he could really play. And he pushed us very, there were some older people too. So again, there weren't a whole lot of kids that played golf at Jefferson, but there were a lot of older people. And, and again, when I was 13, a 21 year old seemed old, you yeah. know, now a 13 year old, he looks at, he wants to be around all these 21 year olds, but the grind was, was there because it was kind of a fun grind. And, and again, I'm a learning I learned a lot. I got better when I was 14 and 17 and 20 and 25. I wasn't some phenom at 20 and won every college event, mm -hmm. but I knew I could play with these guys. And so I would, I'm a big watcher. Like if I, if I, if you, if your son was playing football and you invited me and he was a tight end and he caught two passes, I still would glimpse at him 40% of the game just to see what he did, who he blocked, what he does. When I go to a basketball game, I know what LeBron James is going to do. I, I don't need to watch him for 40 minutes. So I look at everyone else and how they run around and do things. And in golf, I would watch how people 
who would practice. And you say, well, you know, and I'm, I'm known for not a huge practicer, but I would watch how guys did it. Ray Floyd would spend a little bit of time here and then he would go here. And I, he was the guy that I picked his brain and Tom Watson. Tom Watson could stand on the range two hours every day. I could never do that, but I would watch what he worked on. Mm-hmm. And he didn't stand there and work on every club. He went through his bag and it took a while to do that. So I would work on a handful of clubs each day. And then the next day I would change. So I'm a lot of odd to even. I would hit odd clubs on a Tuesday. And then when I went to the range on Wednesday, I would hit my even, my eight, mm-hmm. my six, my four, my two. And so I was always figuring out something to make it a little more interesting. Because as you know, if, if, if you go run a pass pattern or I go hit balls on the range, if I'm not hitting the balls really well in the range, at 30 years old, I should not be on the range. I should be working with my teacher. It's just repetition. But when you get on the golf course, you have to picture that shot. So if you're playing 18th hole of players championship in Jacksonville, you've got to know that if you cut the ball, you hit it at the water and you cut it. And I could visually see most of my shots. Did I hit them all where I was looking? No, but I was more of a visual player. And I'm not mechanic. I was never mechanical. So that really made my life easier in playing golf because I wanted to picture a low nine iron or a high cut shot. Um, and that's what I did. That's really interesting. You know, uh, I've talked about that too, just my, for my own personal journey. And when I finally got my big break, I was a junior in, at the University of Washington. And, you know, I'd, I'd like suffered through all the pain and agony of practicing, practicing, practicing. And then Finally, I got my chance. We're playing Michigan. We're down by two touchdowns. We come back in the fourth quarter. And now with two minutes to go, we're down by seven. And uh, we take the ball all the way down the field in the two-minute drill. And with, I don't know, 18 seconds or something, uh, Steve Pleur throws me a, a pass in the back of the end zone. I went up over the top of the guy, caught it, ended up in Sports Illustrated, and we win the game. <laughs> and, you know, it was a huge moment, right? It was like you winning the match. I mean, it's not that apples. No, but but, it's, yes, it's like winning a tournament. Yeah. But, but what I'm, what I'm trying to say here, my point is, is that um, even though some people said it was lucky or great, you know, they focused on that moment. And the reality is, is I visualize that moment of when you're a little kid, your eyes are shut and I'm dreaming about catching the last second in front of it. I mean, I'd gone through that catch a thousand times yeah, like visually, not yeah. physically. And then I physically had practiced, you know, the fade route in the back of the end zone, not necessarily jumping over people, but, you know, then it all played out, but it played out of what I had visually said I could do and it worked. So I'm relating that to interesting when you see the golf course is really visualizing that shot. I, I'm with you hundred percent. People always ask me, you know, uh, why doesn't this guy win more or, it seems like, you know, this guy is near the lead a lot and he shoots 71 on Sunday. So if you really break down the best players in the world are the best because they're probably the most talented. Mm -hmm. So then you get another section of guys that, that uh, come in and people just, they pick their brain. And what, what I see again, is I, I, I'm a big, student of watching. I I would never go tell too many players, you know, oh, I think you should do this or I think you should do that. But when you watch them, you can see that they don't hit a seven iron 163 on Sunday on the fourth hole. Whereas on Friday and Saturday, they hit beautiful shots. Now their hands are a little tighter or a little looser. You know, they can't control the seven iron. So it goes 40 feet past the pin and they three putt or they hit it short in a bunker. And and the best players, when you watch, for instance, Tiger Woods, I can sit here and I can't tell you a bad iron shot that he's hit. Like I just say, oh, when he was 28 years old at the Buick Classic, of course he got to where he drove the ball pretty poorly for a while. You can come up with a lot of those. But again, in his prime, he never really hit him. He won. 40% 40% of his tournaments. I mean, he was winning six or eight at a clip per season, He's, but I like to go to other people and I just find it. Like you say, you ran your pass route. He you got to the ball up here. You still got it. You came down with it in golf. That's like winning a tournament and you caught the winning touchdown or to tie the game. I don't think yeah. they went overtime back then, but in golf, when you win a tournament in someone now, I don't even know what it is, but 
when the purses got a little higher, they'd say, holy cow, this guy just won a million two, you know, in one week. And I'm like, no, he's 30 years old. He's been doing this since he was 12. This has been going on forever. He just didn't win it starting Thursday. He did yeah, win yeah. the tournament, but he's been busting his tail his whole career. He finally won. And let's see, you know, the big thing is, let's see if you can get to two wins or three wins. But you're correct. I mean, it's it's repetitions, but it's more like I just know my game. I just like you probably know how to get open for your quarterback, which some people it's not that easy. They can run great routes, but they never get open in golf. I just knew each tournament. OK, at Augusta, I need to drive it really well and putt well. What did I work on? I would stand in the range and hit a lot of drivers. And I would go putt 30 and 40 footers because that's what you're going to get there. And you can hit a 30 foot putt 10 feet by in the blink of a hat. If you went to, you know, Sahali, you got to drive the ball really well and you got to be a good iron player. So people sometimes just work on their swing only. I got my swing down. I got my swing down. But you got to get your swing and your game down, in my opinion, for each course that you're playing. I could sit here and ask you questions on and on and on. I'm going to continue to do so, so bear with me. Um, it, it was reported, and, and I haven't asked you about this until I'm asking now, but you, for whatever reason, you know, we all are drawn to different people and people are drawn to us, and you strike different friendships. And one of those friendships that uh, I, I believe that you've had very strong and you felt very close because you guys have had a very trusted um, place to be between the two of you is you and Tiger. You brought him up. Um, why do you think he was drawn to you in terms of just, you know, somebody he could trust considering the amount of worldwide attention that was placed on, on him? Phenomenal golfer, obviously, and in his prime, nobody could catch him. But why do you think that was between you two? You know, besides being on a team, whether it's the Ryder Cup or President's Cup, I've probably had four dinners with him. I, I, I don't seek him out to say, hey, Tiger, you know, I'm going over here to Joe's, Joe's Steakhouse or the yeah. fish place you want to come. But when I talk to him or text him, it's, it's normally about other stuff. And he, he enjoys that, you know. And so I always wanted that from my friends. And I got it, you know. I, 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 hey, I'm going to be uh, at the tournament. I haven't talked to you in six months, but can you get me three – seats to a Laker game because you live there, you know? And so when I text Tiger, it's more, how you doing? How are the kids doing? Uh, not now, but for 20 years. And A, I, I, I absolutely love the way he plays golf. I, I think it's, it's, and he works so hard, which is something I really, I never did. He, he's six or eight hours a day. Butch Harmon, when he went to Vegas, Butch would tell me, he would ship on this green over there three or four hours have lunch and go and like six, he goes, yeah, six hours of just funky shots where he'd plug a ball in the back of a bunker or he'd get an uphill lie. And he just, he loved to be by himself. So if you think about that, if you're me, you know, you, you leave him alone. And one time my caddy, Joe LaCava of 20 something years, he now caddies for Tiger. He says, can you, can you text him and see if you can get him to play in Tampa, which is an unreal course, perfect for Tiger. It was a few weeks before Augusta, and he, Tiger wasn't playing much. So I text Tiger a few times, and then I give him the old, hey, you play in Tampa. I think you should play there. You'll love the course. He texted back, why don't you worry about where you're playing, and I'll play where I want to. And I went, <laughs> and, you know, but, but again, it's, it's pretty crisp, and he yeah. is crisp with me. But what he likes is – waking up at seven o'clock his time and texting me because it's four o'clock on the West coast. He just loves to, to just put that little stake in your heart and twist it. And I enjoy that. I'm kind of like his punching board sometimes, but at the same time, uh, when we hang up, if I text him, he would get back to me in a minute. And basically it's, you know, love you like a brother and hope you're feeling well and thanks bro. And then we're done. Speaking of which, you know, how is he doing right now? He's, do, he's doing well. Uh, again, I say Joe, my caddy, but Joe was caddy for me a couple of times yeah. because my caddy got COVID. And so I called Tiger and he goes, dude, I want Joe to go caddy for you. So I asked Joe a lot and Joe has spent some time with him and he says, you know what? He's working 
He's working harder on his body than he ever has. Will he come back and be the Tiger Woods of old? I, I've never asked him that, but I see him and he's working hard. And Tiger is, is one to, you get him on the wrong day, he might say, you know, I'm not feeling as good as I want to, but he wants to play. And I think, I think he'll be back. I don't really know. Physically, I've not seen him. I went to Florida to work on my game and I was about 45 minutes from where he lives. And he says, dude, I, so, I got so many doctors, so many people. I'm just so tired. Can you, you know, can you see me next time? And I'm like, you bet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, it, it, it's a, the, the one thing that's a beauty about golf is that you can keep playing is as old as you want, relatively speaking. Uh, in, you know, football, you drop off a cliff and that's it. Yeah. I can't go back and organize 22 dudes to go up onto my street, right? And crack heads. Not the way it works. But no. um, I want to ask you about a couple other guys. So, so the thing to me, again, I, I look back and I've got such uh, reverence for your game and what you've been able to accomplish because that's amazing. And there's a lot of guys is like, I was kind of looking down and, you know, over the, the course of all these years, you've been doing this. Um, and, and, and just, you know, Rick Fair, who I know from Seattle and Peter Jacobson and Colin Montgomery and Stuart Appleby. And these guys have all at one time been big for that moment or five years or whatever the number is, but they haven't been able to keep that consistency over time. Right. And maybe your back injuries were a blessing because it allowed you to kind of take off and not keep that grind going. Then maybe it was a curse. I don't know. I mean, but it is amazing when I look at all these names that, that I, I, I wrote down and I was just like, God, you know, like, there's just so many guys. It's so hard to be at that level for that long time, but yet you did it. You're right on. So Rick Fair, when I was 16, I played him at West Seattle in the, in the junior championships and he was 14 and I beat him, I think two and one. And everyone was talking about Rick Fair and he then got on the tour. He played great college golf and he had some injuries and he just couldn't bounce back. Another guy I played with all the time, you would remember Dan Pohl, one of the longest hitters in the world, almost one on Augusta, back surgery, barely played anymore at all. So when, when you look at longevity, Peter Jacobson has had, he, he's still playing, but he had a really, really long run. He, he did have some back, I mean, everyone has a back issue, but the guys you're naming, um, you know, they're all, well, Colin Montgomery's not, but Colin Montgomery's, going to play forever. He's just got the swing in the body, you know, and, but he has very few little injuries and he just, he's a machine. Um, I think as he gets a little older, he, if I could guess, he's not playing as well as he'd like to, but for me, the blessing was that it never got to where I was like done and I could take four months off and I could get away from golf and I could come back and I could honestly pick it up pretty quickly. So I was never like, Oh my God, I'm, I'm, I can't, I can't do it. I I've kind of lost it. And, and that to me really, really helped my career. For instance, I've taken a year off once, maybe twice. And then I come back and like in three weeks, I feel like I can hit the ball really, really well. And then it's just doing it and going to a tournament playing. So again, you know, those, those things helped me, um, you know, and sometimes I play and people say, oh, it's like riding a bike. And I say, no, it's not really like riding a bike because mm -hmm. I'm trying to beat you and I'm trying to beat Phil Nicholson and I'm trying to beat Ernie Els. You know, my bike is still going. But if I shoot 35 on the back nine and they're shooting 32 and 33, you know, I finish third or ninth. So it's that it's that thing of, of, of I've kept it going. I had a few years where I didn't win any after, after 43, I won my last term when I was 43. It bothered me, but it didn't really crush me. And I thought I'd never play the champions tour. And I think it was such a big deal to play. And I really enjoy it. As I was saying, you know, a few minutes ago that golf playing with my friends is really enjoyable. And by playing with them here in big Canyon or in Palm Springs, it gets me a little ready for these, 50 year olds and 60 year olds uh once you win a master's is that a lifetime pass for you to come back and continue to play at least for those first two days yeah i know yeah for the first two days the last couple of years i've only played thursday and friday yeah. it is and then there comes a point 
where they'll, you know, if you start shooting 80, 80, 79, 82, they kind of will maybe call you or say, hey, you know, because you're really taking a spot. And Mark O'Meara, I think, or maybe Ian Woosden were two of the last ones that kind of were near my age group. Mm -hmm. And the course is so long and I can hit it a little further than Mark. So I can still possibly compete if I do everything well. But Mark said, man, I, I just, I can't hit woods to every hole. And so he still goes, but he stopped playing. And I'm hoping to play another three times till I'm 65. And, and I, I love it. Last year I shot uh, 78, 75. And on the 78, I, I tripled the hole from 75 yards. Mm -hmm. So I, that was more embarrassing than probably hitting it in the water on any other hole there. But uh, I know I can still play there and, you know, coming in April, we'll, we'll see again, but um, my length helps me from really embarrassing myself there. So from a, so, so let, let's picture this scene. I blindfold you, I put you in a helicopter and you don't know where you're going to land and I drop you into Augusta, right? And, and, and take away all the fans and the lore and all that kind of stuff. And, and for all, you know, you could be in a course in, in Palm desert or, right. right. So, so I'm asking, would you still have that reverence for that course? Or is it because all the history, because of the fans, because of how well, I mean, it's just like a carpet, right? It's so pure. Is it more that, or would you just say like, hands down of all the courses I've played, this one flipping rocks it? You, you, boy, you got, you're right on spot. So people ask me all the time, if I was gonna play one more round of golf, and get on that helicopter and go to the sky and pass away, it would probably be at Pebble Beach. Ah. Because of the beauty and the last time playing and yeah. And and it's had majors there, PGAs and US Opens. If I was going to play golf every day, I think and I lived in the area, I would want to play at Augusta. There's so many different shots. I mean, the first hole to the 18th, it's it's this and that. But oddly enough, I need the people there because because my first time ever playing it, I just couldn't believe in 1983 that many people were watching me, hmm. but they're watching everyone because there's three or four thousand people a whole. There's 50,000 people there. Now, 10,000 were probably watching Tom Watson and Jack Nichols, a few groups ahead or behind. But still, you're playing in front of people and you get used to that. But 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 Augusta is a place where. Uh, you know, I still want to play Riviera. I played, yeah, played in there. my fifties and and almost beat Phil Mickelson there in in my fifties. So that's a course I can really play because of the knowledge that I have and really the love. If I if I said anything, I would put I would say Seattle helped me play Riviera. Yeah, and I have a great. I've won twice. Honestly, if there's a tournament, I probably could have won again. I would say Augusta would be one, but Riviera, I should have won at least once or twice more. I was right there, uh, you know, didn't do some good things. I lost to Corey Pavin, but Riviera is a place, I think even if I went and played this year, I could do okay. I really think I could make the cut and do okay because of my length and, and how I fit around Riviera. I want to take just a quick veer. You know, the name of the show is Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And, and certainly your back injuries have been, you know, a source of adversity you've had to deal with, I think since she said 1990. Um, also, your, your, your wife passed of breast cancer. And, you know, that would be tragic for anybody to go through. But for, for somebody who their job is traveling the globe while dealing with somebody who's got to be, you know, at home and going to the hospital and going through chemo. And like, what, what was that period of time like for you? Well, it was, I, I will say, so I, I was divorced for a while and I started dating. Her name was Thais and um, probably the 10th, second week, you know, we, we were getting involved with each other and she wasn't feeling good. And so she went to see the doctor and she had breast cancer. And so she came back and um, said, listen, you know, we haven't even dated for a minute and I have two kids and I'm going to get help and I'm going to fight this. You know, I think, I don't think we should see each other. Mm. And at that time, my mom was, was 
passed away and she went through so much. And I thought to myself, you know, I just can't see uh, leaving this person. So we kept going. And then shortly after that, she went to Stanford uh, and got operated on. And then after that, she went to Switzerland for a month. So I was traveling back and forth, uh, hitting balls. I mean, you could write a hitting balls on a farm mm. and some, some, her doctor set me up to hit balls on a farm. The guy came out, cut a little area of grass for me. I had I would hit balls somewhere. There were no golf courses near uh, where we were, but then she turned it around and did extremely well for a long time. And I, no one knows the people at, at Stanford, you know, they said she probably wouldn't be around for eight more months. And she lived she almost lived 14 more years. Wow. So she was, she was kind of a, you know, she was a homeopathic. She did a lot of things. I learned a lot. And then she just, she just ended up, she couldn't fight it any longer, but um, you know, yeah. And that would have been in 2000 and, and, and right kind of, you know, when, when I was playing a lot or 1999, uh, but, you know, golf is golf. I still play. I, I probably didn't play well a little bit. But at sometimes my mind was really not grinding on golf. And I came out and played well at some other tournaments. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, as I look back, uh, you know, I, I would not have changed it any other way. Um, it, 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 it turned out to go a, a bad direction because of money. But as far as the love I had for her and, and all that... I didn't fight hard. My life came kind of easy. I wasn't wealthy at all, but I had great parents. She did not. But what I had was a knack of kind of street smarts and just getting stuff done. And so by watching her, it kind of made me in a good way, a, a, a tougher individual. You know I mean? Yeah. She got down. Yeah. I mean, she, she got down to, you know, she 68 pounds. I mean, they took everything out of her body and she couldn't walk, you know, from, from here to the, she couldn't walk two feet, but then months would go by and, you know, she wasn't seeing her kids. And I'm like, you know, I, I, I never had kids, but I don't know how I would have not seen them, but she's trying to stay alive for her kids. And I felt like I helped her a long ways. And then once she, you know, once she started doing better, she came to see Seattle to see tournaments. She came to other tournaments. She started enjoying it, but she wanted to be by her kids all the time because she missed them for two or three straight years where she was rarely around them. And they had no, they were three and five years old. They had no idea. So I would go home and I would try to take care of them yeah. and get, you know, get Gigi to school. It would be the biggest chuckle because they're they're They just knew their mom was sick. They didn't know where she was, how sick. And again, there was no reason for a three-year-old son to know that she might not be there very long. So we, we, we had some good times and she had friends helping, you know, some of her girlfriends helped out. Her mother ended up helping out a little bit, but uh, it, it was a very interesting couple of years. I mean, to see someone really, really, really fight like that. I wasn't around my mom. My mom was a huge fighter, but I was playing the tour. So she would say, you know, I'm doing well. If you can come in, great. But I never saw her where she looked anything like, you know, my wife did for a year and a half. And so I could never appreciate what my mom went through, although I knew what she went through. But with Thais, I mean, I literally witnessed it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, look, sometimes blessings can come through adversity that you go through and, you know, you're better for it, even though the end result may not be at the time, you know, great, but, you know, certainly look back and it seems like you're very grateful for many of the different things that she was able to, to bring in, you know, to you in, in, in your life. Um, I want to talk about one last thing and that's this radio show you have going on on Sarah's, right? So tell right. me about it. Well, it came about, I, I didn't realize this, but it's been going on almost eight years. So I, I went on a couple radio shows, which I've done, but I went on some like this where they're really good and really fun. And, I'll, and I will say you are phenomenal. I, I've done a lot of interviews, a lot of fun stuff, but I mean, we, we're doing it. It's just flying through it. And that's where, you know, someone's good. And I thought, you know, could I do that? Could I, could I get, I like Dan Patrick, 
but he's on three hours a day every yeah. day. I don't know how he does it. Um, so I, I started out doing two a month and, and would call my friends and, and say, listen, you know, I had Michael Jordan from the Ryder Cup. I had Jerry West for an hour, Jim Nance, you know, uh, George Brett. And he's in, uh, on the tele on, on the tele, on the radio, he says, Fred, I I gotta go. I gotta go. And I said, George, where are you going? Well, I'm going out to throw out the first pitch at the World Series game. He was, I knew he was at the stadium. I didn't know he was doing that. And I must have gotten 50 texts. And five minutes later, okay, but we were, we were, we were live, California, yeah. two to four. He he's he's back there at whatever, 605, throwing out the first pitch. So just weird things happen. I really enjoy it. I have a good friend, George Downing, who does all the dirty work. Uh, I just show up. We talk. We're actually doing it. And hopefully you're going to call in next week. We're going to do it. Yep. And with, with a lot of the Zoom, we tape shows, uh, which for me, I would rather go live because it puts a little more. I like the stress part. If I'm using yeah. that word correct, I, I like to know, you know, we can't say, oh, let's start over. But I enjoy it. And, I, and, I, and, and I'm starting to we asked for two hours instead of one because one hour goes so fast. So the second hour they gave us where we're on, you know, Sirius XM, the golf, and uh, we very rarely talk golf. That's why hopefully I can do as good a job with you next week or the, if you're busy or the next week after that, but yeah. it, it's, I mean, I can tell you're having fun um, and it is fun. It's, it's intriguing. It's, it's, I like to ask people I don't know that well questions. We've had some golfers on. Uh, Tiger Woods was in the car picking up his kids. I've never asked him to come on ever. And he says, dude, he's calling me while I'm doing the show. And he says, call me. And I'm like, I'm on the radio show. I can't. And he says, I want to come on your show. <laughs> and I got so freaking nervous, Mark. So then... I, I had George, I kept talking and George, who knows him, he went to Stanford where Tiger went. So he texted him a number, Tiger called in. He had about two minutes and his kids got in the car and they said, hey, Fred, you know, his little son. And I'm like, oh my, no, this is the best. It's, it's absolutely the best. So uh, I try not to bug anyone, but you know, we got to get people to come on and um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Well, I, I mean, you can see right here. This is these are all my Fred couple notes right here. Right. And, you, and you never saw me look down. And so I really believe that the the great art of 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 doing an interview is your ability to listen. And you actually are the one who guided me through this entire podcast. So I appreciate you for that. And you know, I did a bunch of background. You know, so I I have I come in with a basis baseline a little bit, but you know, again, I think it's it's it. There's a certain style when people go through and they. You know, they just kind of check off the questions that they already had pre-planned. And that's just not a great way to have that spontaneous interaction. Because if yeah. you and I go down and have a beer in Newport Beach, I'm not going <laughs> to ask you a bunch of checklist questions. We're just going to talk about whatever. Shoot the shit, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, I mean, I've learned, I will say, I've learned a lot from Jim Nance, too. Yeah. Um, you know, Jimmy's, Jimmy will tell you, you know, you just got to be ready. But be, he says all the time, be yourself. And so sometimes we do do things together. And he goes, There's, I said, no, script. he goes, oh, I love that, Jim. I don't even want to know what you're going to ask me. I, I, I don't even want to know because then I'm thinking about it. And then I might not say it the same way that I would, you know, when you ask me a question. So yeah. when I do it, you know, we, we, we had Charles Barkley on and all I had to do was say, hi, Charles. <laughs> he, went for, he went for 30 minutes and, and it was incredible. It wasn't even during the NBA. It was just, it was during a tournament that's in Alabama and I couldn't play. And that's so why I texted him and we were supposed to get paired. Will you come on the show? And, and he went on coach Saban. I'm, I'm name dropping, but these yeah. guys, this is what they do for a living and they're so good at it. And it just makes, it makes your show better. And that's why I'm enjoying it. And I don't know how long, like how long have you been doing it? Uh, two years now. Yeah. So no, I've been no, eight. No practice. Yeah. No. Right. But, but I mean, it's just like, Hey, how are you? Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, the actor, Tom Arnold, he played, did a bunch of stuff with Arnold Schwarzenegger and he's yeah. on the, the yeah. you know, the Arnold show. I, I had him on and he, I, all I said is hi. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, 
and then I said by at the end. I mean, he just goes on and on and on all these tangents, and it was, yeah. some people just communicate, you know, in strange ways. So listen. You have been an absolute joy. I, I can't believe I had the good fortune of John Bracken. Thank you, buddy, um, if you're listening, uh, for setting and facilitating this. Uh, we come from the same roots, the same background. Love it. And, uh, you know, continued success. And I'll be the, the biggest fan out there rooting for you for that. I, hopefully, it's not your last win, but your next win um, yeah. on the Players Tournament. And good luck with your back. And, and uh, next time in SoCal, you know I'm going to get a text, or you're going to get a text from me. Okay talking about getting out there i'm gonna i'm gonna show you what a strong grip is <laughs> <laughs> well hopefully bracken hopefully we can meet bracken bracken's a good man but i'm gonna george downing's my partner we're gonna i'll be texting you we'll have you on next week we're gonna go monday and we can get 15 20 minutes of your time or longer yeah. we're all ready because uh, it's a great story go dogs and uh you have fun you Folks, he's going to be what, November 9th, correct? In Vegas? Well, I'll be in November 9th in, in uh, for the Las Vegas. Sounds weird. Raiders, right? Ra the yeah, the Vegas Raiders, yeah. right. Yeah. Playing Shadow Creek, which mm -hmm. I bet a lot of people haven't played. I've played one time there. No, you got to know some people, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know the Vegas Raiders. So you're, you're, you're in Lake Flynn. There he is. The one, the only Freddie Couples. Thank you.